Well, hello, my name's Nigel Parker and I'm the Senior Minister here at St Paul's Anglican Church and I'd like to welcome you to our service today, uh, this Sunday, 29th of November, which is of course Advent Sunday, the beginning of the season of recognising Jesus coming and, uh, and then celebrating with Christmas, of course. Uh, today we are going to continue in our series in the Sermon on the Mount and we'll be considering a number of issues in that, prayer, giving and fasting. I trust that's going to be helpful to us. But with an Advent Psalm, let's hear from David, who says this from Psalm 25. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are of from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Our God is indeed good. We're going to sing of his praises now with the great hymn, And Can It Be?
as we come together, knowing the goodness of our God and the times we fail to follow him and do as he wills. Let's join together now in this prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. And of course, the good news of the gospel is, is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have confessed our sins. God is faithful to his promises and he has forgiven us. And for this, we rejoice. I learned that when he made Eve, he took part of Adam's rib to make her. was that we got to do fun stuff like waterside and pool and we but we still got to learn about Jesus. Um, the pool and jumping castle. The thing is um, the waterside and learning about Jesus. Well, it was great to enjoy that weekend a couple of weekends ago as uh, we went to square one and the kids were taught to trust the Lord their God with all their heart. Uh, we have a responsibility to teach children to trust Jesus. I'm really thankful for my position here and being able to do that, but it's a responsibility for each one of us. But as well as teaching about Jesus, we have a responsibility to care for children, to keep them safe. And so I'm so thankful for our diocese's high standards for safe ministry. Um, if you are involved in children's ministry in any way, uh, I'll be in touch with you over the next couple of weeks. There are a couple of things changing for safe ministry practices, as well as requiring a working with children check and having up to date safe ministry training. We need to do now a safe ministry check as well uh, before the start of next year. So if you're currently involved in children's ministry, I'll be giving you a call sometime in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you're not yet involved in children's ministry, but would like to be, would like to be available to be, to help out with kids church or scripture or anything like that, I'd love you to get in touch with me uh, and I can help you through the process we need, we need to do in the meantime. So it's great 
that we do have to do this training, uh, this certification, because we want to care for children. And so we need our working with children check, our safe ministry training up to date, and a safe ministry check. Thanks very much, guys. Talk to you again soon. In a moment, Murray's going to lead us in prayer. But before we get to prayer, just a couple of things for your attention by way of notice. Do follow us on Facebook at St. Paul's Anglican Shell Harbour, where we sometimes update some news for you that might be helpful. I want to also mention that uh, Sam and Craig McCorkingdale and their children, Claire, Hannah and Joel, are of course our CMS missionaries who are serving in Cambodia. They're not there at the moment. Uh, they're about to return in January. And so we're going to have a commissioning service for them. That's on Saturday, December the 5th at 10 a.m. And this will be conducted at Shell Harbour City Anglican Church. And it would be great if you can come along and support Sam and Craig as they prepare to return to Cambodia. Uh, great to do that together, to pray, and to encourage them and to, uh, to hear from God's word. So please come along if you can. That would be great. Also, uh, this, at this time of year, as we head towards Christmas, we're supporting Anglicare's Toys and Tucker Appeal. And this is, of course, an opportunity to help those who are in difficulty or need at this time with simple things of food and toys for children. Uh, so if you'd like to help out, that would be a great thing to do. Things to, to bring to the office here are, of course, things like uh, canned food, uh, dry food is all good. Uh, please, the only thing we can sort of say don't bring is, is of course, things like chocolate or uh, anything, any container that can break or is soft in its, uh, in its makeup. So that would be much appreciated. Uh, also, of course, toys for preschoolers, for children and for teenagers are all appreciated at this time because of hardship within a family and uh, we, we do appreciate your response. But now we're, uh, we're going to go to prayer and Murray's going to lead us in that. Well, let's pray. I'm going to pray based on the Lord's Prayer, and then as we conclude, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, what an incredible privilege that we can call you Father, that we can approach confidently through Jesus and have access to speak to you. You are a holy God. May we honour your name. Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we acknowledge our sin and rejoice again at your mercy, that through Jesus you accept us and you hear our prayers. May your kingdom come, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your plans for all things, that you are bringing all things together under Jesus. Help us to always trust your good plans and to work with all our strength to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We rejoice, Lord, that you give us all that we need that you provide for us. Please continue to give us our daily bread, that we can serve and honour you at all times. Lord, we mourn that so often we reject you and seek other things. Please, Lord, deliver us from temptation. By your Spirit, help us to know our own weaknesses and rely on your strength to grow in faith and godliness. Lord, there is still so much trouble and evil in our world. Please protect us from evil. Keep us trusting you at all times. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Amen. Lord, we pray again for our world in the midst of coronavirus. We pray for all those around the globe who are suffering, that you would ease their suffering, and that you would draw them to trust in you. We pray for medical professionals and for government officials. Give them great wisdom to care for all people, and draw them to rely on you to provide them the strength they need for their difficult roles. Lord, we thank you greatly for the decrease in case numbers here in Australia. Lord, we thank you that you are working and that you are good. Lord, we pray that numbers will continue to, to lower and that we can uh, open up to our different freedoms as we approach Christmas. But Lord, at all times, help us to trust you whatever the circumstances. Lord, we thank you for our SRE classes. As they finish up this week, Lord, I pray for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those in all the classes. Lord, I pray that you will help the children to respond uh, to your incredible love for them, to your grace offered to them through Christ. Help them to understand what it means that Jesus came to earth to bring them peace with you. Lord, as we approach Christmas, 
Please be with all churches as they consider how to best meet together and how to continue to proclaim your word to the world around them, even while being concerned and careful about people's physical health. Father, please be with Nigel and us here at St Paul's. Enable us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those around us, especially at this time. Lord, you made all things and you made us in your image to enjoy and govern them. We thank you for your work in creation, for the beauty we enjoy, for human skill and artistry. We thank you for community, friendship, love, for family and marriage, for the privilege of parenthood. Above all, we thank you for Jesus, your son, through whom you created all things and by whom you sustain them. We thank you that he became one of us and died to reconcile all creation to you in heaven and on earth and to call us into peace with you. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Uh, and let's now join in the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we come to hear from God's word, let us join together in the words of this simple creed. With all Christians everywhere, we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, who made everything, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus rose again as Lord of all and will return in glory to judge and to save. God sent his Holy Spirit to live in us that we might grow to be more like Jesus. Amen. And let's pray as we come to hear from God's word. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, our first reading for this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 1 to 14. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the, of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. 
You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honourable, and if you honour it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. And we'll turn now to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, as we continue Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And jumping now to verse 16. When you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And we'll now turn to Luke chapter 18, from verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to the word of God, let me lead us in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you speak to us because you have spoken through your word. We pray now that we would hear this good word, Father, and that you will use it to shape us and mould us to be the people that you want us to be. We pray, Father, that uh, you will be at work by your spirit, and we ask you do this now for your glory in Jesus' name. Well, it's a shame, isn't it? But it seems that the world is divided between those who do good and don't they know it, and those who don't do good and couldn't really care less. What would it be like to meet a person who does good but doesn't care about their do-good reputation? Well, Jesus says today that that's the Christian, or it ought to be. Now, as we come to Matthew chapter 6, where we turn from the moral issues of chapter 5, anger, lust, marriage and forgiveness, we turn now to the subject of religious practices. Now, all religions have something to say about charitable giving, prayer and fasting. But according to Jesus, there's a major problem with our religious efforts. See what he picks up about good works? He issues at the very beginning of our passage a warning. Verse 1, be careful. What are we to be careful of? Our religious practices. Jesus declares they are not to be performed in front of people 
for public viewing. For if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven, he says. And Jesus then explains the danger of being honoured by men. See, in verse 2, pious folk do things to be honoured by men. Verse 5, to be seen by men. In verse 16, to show men. You see, there is something deep within our humanity that takes doing good and makes it an occasion to boast in ourselves. And so suddenly, good isn't the point. We are the point. And so Jesus lifts the lid on the do-gooders' dirty little secret. Do-gooders don't do good to do good. They do good to be seen to be doing good. Preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones said, ultimately, our only reason for pleasing men around us is, is that we may be pleased. We want people to think well of us, so shows of virtue or honourable behaviour are important to us. And we love adulation and recognition for our efforts. We love having our ego stroked by acknowledgement and salute. It is for our ego that we are spoken of well by others, that we may feel good about ourselves. And Jesus says, Christians beware. Again in verse 1, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Instead, in verse 3, he says, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You see, Jesus characterizes the correct way to give as a secret. You see, this kind of giving is so self-forgetful, it's as though the hand that gives is acting completely independently of the other hand. This act of righteousness in this instance, giving, is a good action that we, we don't connect to ourselves, Jesus says, to our sense of identity and worth and honour, to our ego. Jesus wants us to understand such giving is like an involuntary nose scratch. It's just something that we do. I, I didn't realise how much I fidget a nose scratch until this year when Zoom made me see myself a fair bit on a screen. But seriously, Jesus wants us to understand the giving that God honours draws no attention to itself. It doesn't attract the attention of others, and it doesn't even attract our own attention. Not our head, not our heart, nor even our other hand will reflect on the act. Let's understand. This mention of the left and the right hand doesn't mean so much as it did to the people in Jesus' day. You see, in Jesus' day, there was a clear arrangement of tasks that either hand could perform. Let's just say that the right hand performed noble tasks like shaking someone's hand and eating. But the left hand, it performed banal or grubby acts like removing shoes and toileting. And the two hands had to stick strictly to their tasks. They had to know what the other was doing. But Jesus says giving to the needy is to be so unselfconscious that even one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. In giving, there should be no fanfare, no smugness, no congratulation, no appeasement of conscience. We will just do good. It's to be simply part of who we are. I don't know whether you have noticed, but as you hear Jesus preach through the Sermon on the Mount, you can hear echoes of the character of a follower of Jesus that he's spoken about in the Beatitudes all the way through. And here are the qualities of meekness and mercy. We are to give, we are to do this, we are simply to be good and do good. And doing good without any mind for being seen or acknowledged by anyone else. Don't do charitable deeds to be praised by anyone, including yourself. Don't dwell on your secret good deeds, but forget all about them. Don't do it for public applause. Don't do it to feel good about yourself. It's worth noting that Jesus never prohibits doing good to be seen. He prohibits doing good to be seen by people. So give to the poor for God's sake. Whether anybody sees you or not, whether you get a tax write-off or not, whether it boosts your self-esteem or not, other people and their opinions don't matter. It is God's opinion that matters. You see, he sees what we do. He knows our hearts and he knows we crave an audience. So here Jesus commands us to switch our audience from earth to heaven. Let's move from giving to prayer 
in verses 5 and 6 where we see Jesus teach what's true of charity also applies to public prayer. How are we to view public prayer? Well, clearly, public prayer is part of Christian fellowship in our services. Were the Jews required to pray in public? They were, just as we do. But for them, just as for us, praying at a prayer meeting or in the pulpit or in family worship or even at the dinner table can subtly move from praying to performing. And Jesus knows that the scribes and the Pharisees preferred praying in the synagogue to praying at home because more people would hear them. And this is why they rarely, if ever, prayed alone, because alone no one could hear them but God. And, and he wasn't impressed by their eloquence or devotion. He considered their prayers to be babbling. Now, for these scribes and Pharisees, the synagogue was their preferred place to show off their prayers, their piety, but it wasn't the only place they could do it. And in those times, morning and evening sacrifices were offered every day at the temple. Before they were, however, trumpets were blown to alert the people. And when the people heard the blaring horns, they were to stop, face the temple and offer their prayers to God wherever they were, whatever they were doing. And knowing this, the scribes and the Pharisees made a point to be found on the busiest streets at 6 a.m. in the morning and 6 p.m. in the evening every day so that their long and beautiful prayers could be heard by as many people as possible. And the thing was, if they were eloquent men and knew how to put on a sad face for confession and a beaming face for praise, they became celebrities in Israel, men famous for their devotion to God as expressed by their eloquent prayers. But Jesus dismisses this whole thing as a sham. He says in verse 5, they have received their reward in full. And so the question is, what kind of prayer does God reward? Well, Jesus teaches here that our Heavenly Father rewards prayer that is genuine, that seeks true communion with him, that's not a show or performance. And the logic is simple. Because there's no show when we're alone in private, in a place of solitude or in an empty room, it's there that true communion and conversation with God can happen. In this secret place, uh, the, the theologian Dr. John Stott said, our Father is there waiting to welcome us. Just as nothing destroys prayer like side glances at human spectators, so nothing enriches it like the sense of the presence of God. For he sees not the outward appearance only, but the heart, not the one who is praying only, but the motive for which he prays. The essence of Christian prayer is to seek God. And please understand, Jesus isn't prohibiting the place of public prayer. Rather, he's rejecting those that simply use prayer as a means for public praise and for preening their pride. So moving to verses 16 through 18, if charity and prayers were at the top of the Pharisees and scribes' acts of righteousness list, then fasting was a close third. Now, at that time in Jesus' day, fasting was re required one day a year on the Day of Atonement. But though it was commanded only once a year, most Jews practiced it far more often, even up to twice a week for the Pharisees and scribes. It was understood in Jewish life that fasting was a formal and public way of confessing sin and pleading for mercy, both of, thing, both of which are good things. But like other good things, fasting here was put to bad use. The hypocrites did it for public approval and consequently they did all they could to show men they were fasting, as Jesus says. They disfigure their faces, Jesus says, maybe sucking in their cheeks when others were looking or using makeup to seem extra white, so drained were they by their penitence. Now it must be understood that Jesus approved of fasting, of course, but again, he wants his people to do it privately, not calling attention to themselves. In fact, in verse 17, they were to oil their heads and wash their face, perhaps even appear well-fed on the days they fasted. Why? Because then only would God alone know they were fasting in repentance. Again, only then was it real. The Lord never wanted fasting for the sake of fasting. He wanted it for the sake of repentance and for seeking his mercy. And for this reason, he despises the disfigured faces of those who publicly reveal their fasting when their heart is in fact unrepentant. As David reminds us in Psalm 51, 
what the Lord will never despise is a broken and contrite heart. So here are the way religious acts, acts of righteousness, giving to the needy, prayer and fasting are to be done. They are to be performed with care, not seeking public acclamation or recognition. And rather than being performed to an earthly audience, they are carried out and directed towards our Heavenly Father in secret that he would see and know our hearts. And the question is, who lives like this? Well, of course, Jesus does. He began his ministry hearing his father's approval from heaven in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he traveled through the world, the freest man who ever lived. He was free of self-focus. He was free of egotism. He was free of vanity. He was free of the need to perform to a worldly audience for praise or adoration. Have you noticed that Jesus never pulled Peter to one side saying, how do you think, Peter, that sermon went down? Some of the crowds seem unhappy of how I ended the parable. He never reminded his grumbling disciples, hey, can I have a bit of respect here? Do you have any idea what I'm doing for you? There were no scores kept, no pity parties, no fanfares and no ego trips. Jesus is all virtue and no signaling. He just does good, forsaking the approval of men, but knowing the smile of his father. And that's the key today, the Father. Our Father in heaven sees what is done in secret. And it's his smile that is the reward of our souls. In Jesus, we are adopted by the Father, filled with his spirit, united unbreakably with our righteous high priest. So that now we can walk into the world in the sunshine of heavenly approval and simply live. And this is the gift that Jesus gives us. He's not calling us to a different quantity of giving, praying and fasting, but an entirely different quality. He's inviting us into a world in which giving, praying and fasting aren't the point. And we are not the point. Our Father is. And the simple goodness of the deed is performed only because we love the Father. But in this, ourselves and our honour is cleared right out of the way. Our left hand won't even know the good deeds our right hand is performing because when we're properly heavenly minded, then finally we can become of earthly good use. You see, we perform to an audience of one and our passage today challenges us to consider which king and which kingdom we serve, the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of heaven. And it is clear that the behaviours and motivations of these two kingdoms contrast enormously. One kingdom is all show, all appearance, all recognition, and that wonderful modern phrase, it's all about virtue signalling. And Jesus describes the members of this kingdom as hypocrites, which was a theatrical term related to actors who used masks to play different characters in the theatre. But its use here by Jesus is, of course, reality. And here Jesus means people who hide their true self behind false piety, who take an important act of devotion to God, whether it be giving or fasting or prayer, and they turn it into a play or a performance for applause, acknowledgement, adulation and praise. The other kingdom is a kingdom where goodness is performed with a genuine heart in secret, as there's no concern to parade or make public the good done. And it's done to a heavenly father who sees and knows everything and who unfailingly rewards the good that's done in secret. Because good done in secret, performed to an audience of one, is naturally genuine. You see, we've seen illustrated three times in our passage in giving, prayer and fasting, the contrast of these two kingdoms. And the presence of these two kingdoms raises for us important questions. Which king do we serve? Which kingdom are we looking to and serving and wanting to be a citizen of? Where is our hope and life and assurance? What is the hope of our hearts? Are we invested in this world and the, the opinions of the people of this world? Or are we invested in the Lord? 
And so our passage today asks us to question what we love. Uh, Theologian James Smith says, to be human is to have a heart. You can't not love. So the question isn't whether you will love something as ultimate. The question is what you will love as ultimate. And you are what you love. So do we ultimately love this world or the kingdom of heaven? Do we find our hope and our life and our satisfaction and our security and our assurance and our happiness in the Lord and in him alone? Is it his smile alone that motivates and spurs you on or the smiles of well-wishers and the people of this world? Is our religion all about what God can give us, what we can get out of him for our benefit here in this life? Or do we see as the Bible shows us that the Lord is in himself all we need now and for eternity? Is God all you need such that he is all you need to love and for love? Is his love your all and everything? I finish by challenging you as I challenge myself today. Examine your heart, particularly in light of God's love towards you. Chew upon this truth. God loves his children. The apostle John explains love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So I ask you to consider, in the solitude of the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus faces the world's sin, that's my sin and your sin, as he prepares in that solitary prayer to give his very life, his all, to be starved of life, to be starved of heaven, to be starved of fellowship with his father, for, for it all to be taken away, all of which he does in love for me and for you, is that love enough for you? Just stop right here. Loiter with me around the, this monument of theological truth. Drink from the fountain of gospel love and stop with the qualifiers. Just enjoy this staggering truth as you look in faith to Jesus and God's love for you in him. And it is this staggering truth of the love of God in the riches of Christ's cross that drove the apostle Paul to his knees to pray, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. May this love of Christ fill us and be all we need and desire. Let the Apostle John have the final word. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the love that you have lavished on us. We rejoice that we are your children because of this love. And we thank you that it all becomes clear to us in the cross of Jesus Christ, that there he gave his life, that our sin may be atoned for, that our that our resurrection may be assured and we give you thanks father for this love may we love you father with our whole hearts may that be a love that is not paraded before the world it is one that we hold dear to us as we serve you fully and only and we pray this in jesus name amen well thank you for joining us today i trust our time has been encouraging to you as we finish let me share these words with you. 
Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. We're going to finish our time now by joining together in song with this great song, Behold Our God.
身上，扎实。